Hey guys, Pastor Kelly here this beautiful Wednesday evening. Thank you for joining us, man. And you all know by now, unless you, this is the first time you've watched uh, what we do, uh, New Beginnings Church, we do meet at 6.30 on Wednesdays, live in the house, and we pray, and then we go out and we do outreach stuff. So I pre-record this uh, every, every Wednesday, so we'll have a message there. So I appreciate you watching, New Beginnings Church. God bless you guys. Thank you all for watching. Please share this on social media. Share, hit the share button on Facebook and share it. And uh, we believe that the more people that hear the gospel, man, the more the word gets out, the more people are going to come to Christ. Amen. So I want to continue today uh, our series on the prayer life of Jesus. A lot of good things going on in our church. A lot of good things happening uh, at Brown House of Refuge with our men's home and at New Beginnings Church and our church. And just really cool stuff happening, brother. And man, it's been it's been a time. And but today I want to focus in on the teaching on prayer. And I'm hoping that you guys that are watching are getting something out of it. Amen. But today I want to talk about the weapons of your warfare. I want to talk about prayer as a weapon. As as I've been telling you to, we are using this <laughs> kind of real loosely, but we are using uh, this book, The Prayer Life of Jesus, Developing Years by Looking at His, written by our, our good friend and great author, Dr. Glenn Arekian. And today I'll be kind of drawing from chapter three of that. I think this is part seven in, in, in our teaching, but we're in chapter three of that. If you'd like to get with me or I'll leave a link down below where you can order this book and use it to go by. Great book on prayer, great thing to go by, and, and it'll bless you if you order it. And it's just been, and I'll put a link to Brother Glenn's website and all that. And if you'd like an order book, I'm sure they'd be glad to get you one. But I want to talk today about the weapons of our warfare. Before I do, join me if you would <clears throat> as we pray. Father, Lord, tonight I just pray, Lord God, that for I pray for revelation, knowledge, and wisdom. I pray for supernatural ability, Lord, to communicate your word. And also, Lord, give us a supernatural ability to hear it and to receive it, I pray, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Last week, we talked about the transfiguration. We talked about when Jesus uh, was transfigured and, and was talking to John the Baptist and Elijah and all that went on with that. And and, and also, we talked before about that, about him being tempted 40 days and 40 nights, uh, the time before last by the enemy, and how he prayed and fasted, and we talked about all that. But now, what I would like to do today is kind of come at a little bit different area, come from a different angle about what prayer is and why to pray, and, and some, of the, some of the things that occur when you pray. And so, I'm going to begin reading, first of all, in Luke chapter 4 in verse 14 and it says that and this is referring to after the 40 days and nights of fasting and temptation from the enemy and all that <clears throat> and it says in Luke 4 14 and Jesus returned in the power of the spirit into Galilee and there went out a fame of him through all the region round about I'm going to read it one more time and Jesus returned in the power of the spirit in the Galilee and there went out a fame of him through all the region round about. And so Jesus had did this, and he'd gone through all that. And the other side of that, even though he went through some things, even though there were supernatural things occurring around him, through him, and in him, during all this time after he fasted and prayed, then when that season was over, <clears throat> think about this. Man, when that season was over, it says then he returned in the power of the Spirit. I want to talk about the power of prayer, and, and, and I want to talk a little bit tonight about the unseen realm, too. And it says that when Jesus went back to Gal Galilee, his fame went out through all the region, through all the area there. Well, the, the thing of it is, is, is in that region, he, in the natural, he hadn't done anything yet. Now, nobody really knew yet as far as humans go, but I want to tell you something, man. The realm that you can't see is more powerful and more real than the realm you can see. The unseen realm, you know, Jesus said, God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And, and it's an unseen realm that is the power realm. It's an unseen realm that's actually more real than 
this earthly realm. And matter of fact, Jesus said heaven and earth will pass away, <clears throat> but my word, he said, will never pass away. So I want to talk about the unseen realm a little bit. And I want to talk about what happens in a spiritual realm when you pray. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. We all know Ephesians 6 is the, if you're a believer and have been very long, you know about the whole armor of God and all that, which is not what I'm going to talk about tonight. But in Ephesians, Ephesians 6, 12, it says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Our, our, our battle is not against each other. It's not against another human. It's not against flesh and blood, but against <clears throat> principalities, against powers against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Ladies and gentlemen, in that unseen realm and in other dimensions, man, there are things that manipulate or at least attempt to control or at least attempt to humanity and things and jesus understood this and part of the power that he got was a power yes to we always talk about casting out devils healing the sick doing all these things that's awesome it's great it's real but also there came a power where he could take authority over some unseen stuff over the unseen realm that by and large humans are oblivious to most humans in their day-to-day -day walk don't even give the supernatural a second thought. They don't even give the other dimension of the spirit a second thought. Here the Apostle Paul writes in Ephesians, it said, we're not fighting against flesh and blood. I think in this season, especially in, in the American political realm, we need to remember that our battle is not against each other. Our battle is not against a human that happens to be of, of a different political party than we are or even a different religion than we are, da, 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 da. No, no, no. The battle is against principalities, not flesh and blood, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness, spiritual wickedness in high places. Man, I'm, I'm here to tell you right now that, that through prayer, there are things that that go on in a realm we can't really comprehend and certainly that we can't see, that we don't think we have any way to affect or any way to reach into. But man, I want to tell you something. When you're on your face before God and when you pray, and Jesus understood this. Jesus, when he, when he overcame everything he overcame in those 40 days and nights of fasting and prayer, yeah, it, it, it dealt with some stuff that we talked about before. But here it says that when he came out, then the enemy took notice. When, when he came out of that, when he returned to Galilee, he returned in the power of the spirit. He returned with an amount of authority that had not been exercised from a human standpoint ever before. Think about that. But previously, in the New Testament, we have the accounts of John the Baptist, man, that 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 preached repentance and baptized folk and 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 God gave him great favor. You don't see a lot of miracles or anything like that that's recorded that John the Baptist did. If you look in the Old Testament, you have uh, miracles from guys like Elijah, you know, that called fire down from heaven. E Elisha, the, to where all kinds of supernatural things happen. Yeah, uh, Moses, the Red Sea parted. I mean all kinds of miracles that happened even in the Old Testament. But here in the New Testament, you see Jesus beginning to affect another realm. In fact, in the Old Testament, the demonic and things like that really aren't mentioned that much. The supernatural realm, <clears throat> the unseen realm really isn't addressed a whole lot in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, Jesus comes out with authority and power in the spirit man and it got the enemy's attention the apostle paul i'm going to read it one more time ephesians 6 said we're not wrestling against flesh and blood but against principalities against powers against the rulers of, of darkness in this world against spiritual wickedness in high places ladies and gentlemen there's times when somebody you love or maybe even yourself is being affected 
influenced, manipulated by that thing in an unseen realm that they've given themselves up. They've given themselves over to sin or they've, we always talk about addiction. They've given themselves over to addiction or they've given themselves over to some kind of spiritual darkness. And therefore <clears throat> it opens a door for that darkness to come in, for that darkness to control, for that darkness to manipulate. Jesus now here begins to exercise authority over that. And I'm going to read also in Luke chapter 11. And verse 20 through 26, and this is Jesus speaking. And he said, but if I with the finger of God cast out devils, now they had just accused Jesus in this passage. <laughs> they had just accused Jesus of casting out devils by the power of the devil, by the power of Beelzebub, by the power of the man devil, you know. So everything got to be about the devil. They got to find the devil, you know. And so they didn't understand what Jesus was doing. So they attributed what he was doing which was casting out devils in that instance <laughs> to the power of the devil. And that sounds stupid. And Jesus even said that, but he said it a little nicer. He said, but if I with the finger of God cast out devils, no doubt the kingdom of God has come upon you. See, when you begin to influence that unseen realm, that demonic, that has that's controlling people, manipulating people, all those kinds of things. And when you when you step up and you begin to take authority over that and it begins to happen, man, the kingdom of God has come upon you. Verse 21 says, when a strong man armed keeps his palace, his goods are in peace. In other words, when a strong man is armed, weaponized, his goods are untouched in his palace, in his kingdom. But when a stronger than him, or when, excuse me, when a stronger than he shall come upon him and overcome him, he takes from him all his armor wherein he trusted and divides his spoils. It says, and what he's referring to here is the enemy who tries to set up shop. And the enemy can only work when humans give him or give them authority. A demon, a demon can't just pop in and try to do his thing. No, no. Try to manipulate you. Try to control you. But it can't happen unless you give him authority or give it authority, okay? And so it, then when you do, that thing sets up shock, begins to exercise its influence and authority over its palace, over what it thinks it controls, okay? And, and it does control when it's given that control. It says, but then when some, someone stronger comes in, I hope y'all are hearing this, and this has to do with anything, man. When someone stronger comes in, he will overcome him and take from him all his armor. In other words, when you exercise the authority of the Holy Spirit, the authority of the name of Jesus, the authority of the blood of Jesus, the authority as a child of God over the unseen realm, here's what it says. It says it will overcome him and it will take from him all his armor. In other words, it destroys all the defenses that the enemy has set up. So man, if there's demonic influence, if there's things in the darkness trying to rule around you, man, let me tell you, you have the authority in the name of Jesus to overcome that stuff and disarm it. But let me tell you, it doesn't just happen. It doesn't just happen by default, man. You have to lean into that realm. You have to speak into that realm. You have to take authority over that realm, whether it's in your life, with something that, that where you maybe you've given yourself over to darkness in your life, you go, well, I'm a Christian. I'm you may be a Christian, but if you've given yourself over to some darkness in your life, if you've given yourself over to something, then you relinquish some control there and gave something that has no business having control over you control. Uh, you, uh, you can, and I'm not, this is going to sound bad. I don't mean to sound bad, but you can, you can pop off, I love Jesus, I love Jesus all day long, man. But your treasure's where your heart is. And if you've given something else control, and you refuse to exercise any authority over that. And as you do, then the Holy Spirit comes in, convicts and convinces. And a lot of times the Holy Spirit will come in. And as, as you begin to exercise authority over that and go, well, here's where you open the door. And you need to close this door. Because as long as you keep that door open, that thing is going to keep on getting in. <laughs> we have dogs at my house. And as long as I, if I keep my back door open, those dogs come in and out at will. And here's the thing, when they come in and out and will, like, for instance, today, if I leave the door open, 
Number one, it's going to get hot inside the house. This evening, as the sun goes down, if I leave the door open and I don't close that door from outside influences, mosquitoes, bugs, all kind of stuff will get in. So what up? Why are you saying that, Pastor Kelly? Well, in your life, there may be, and probably is somebody that's listening, you've opened the door somewhere in your life. You may be a believer, you may not be a believer, but you're listening and this is ringing true in between your ears and in your heart. You'll begin to go, oh, that's what the issue is. You, you keep falling in the same old pitfalls. You keep tripping over the same old stuff in life. The same old thing keeps happening, man. And you may have even, you may be a believer. You may have, you know, be a follower of Jesus to a degree, but you keep hitting the same wall. You don't understand why. My guess is, and most likely, you've opened the door somewhere. You may be, you may be addicted to pornography and nobody knows. You may be that kind of thing, man, and it just keeps creeping back. And then you just condemn yourself. You hate yourself. You bet you've opened the door that you need to close in the spirit. Okay, it may be an addiction. It may be a thought like it may be a habitual thing that you just seem like you can't get over. It's because you've opened the door to darkness in your life. Now, God's made a way through the blood of Christ, made a way through the name of Jesus, made a way by making you a child of God, a son or a daughter of God. But if you don't exercise that authority, you're going to be tripping over the same old stuff, hitting the same old wall, losing the same old battles that you've always lost. You don't have to do that, man. There's a better way. So Jesus said, when a stronger than him comes and overcomes him, he takes from him all his armor that he trusted in. You can defuse and disarm the enemy in your life, man, and divides his spoils. And then verse 23, Jesus said, eh, he that is not with me is against me. And he that scatters, or excuse me, he that gathers not with me scatters. Boy, that's a powerful verse. Jesus said, if you're not with me, you're against me. And if you don't gather with me, you scatter. You see, some people, they may or may not know some things to say religiously. <laughs> they, they may know all the right catchphrases, man, but your treasures where your heart is. A tree can only bear fruit after its own kind. And that tree may be trying to convince you that it's a plum tree, may be trying to convince you that it's a peach tree, but if it's a persimmon tree, <laughs> or if it's a lemon, there's no way it's ever going to taste like a plum. You understand what I'm saying? So he gives you power to overcome these things. But Jesus said, if you're not with me, you're against me, no matter what you say. If you're not with him, you're against me. So if you're not gathering with him, the sad thing about it is, if you're not walking in unity with him, you're bringing division. He that does not gather, gather with me scatters, Jesus said. Now. Here's the principle in verse 24. <clears throat> it's, Jesus said, when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, is he talking about there, an unclean spirit, a demon spirit. When an unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walks through dry places seeking rest. He's talking about the demonic here. It says when an unclean spirit leaves, he walks in dry places seeking rest and doesn't find any. And finding none, he says, I will return unto my house whence I came out. And when he comes, he finds it swept and garnished. Then he goes and takes to him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. What? Now, those of you that have been with me for years or heard me teach for years, you've heard me teach on this a hundred times. Well, listen one more time. <clears throat> this can change your life if you will let it. Now, you've got to let it or it won't happen. Think about the principle here. Jesus said, when an unclean spirit leaves, you cast the devil out of somebody, okay? It's going to go in dry places looking for rest. When it doesn't find any, it's going to come back knocking to the house it came out of. That's talking about the human it came out of. Okay? Now, listen. Temptation is going to come. 
things are going to come. It's not a sin. This has come up in our men's home lately. It's not a sin to be tempted, but it is a sin to fall into that temptation. It's a sin to open the door to that thing. And it says it's going to come, and if it finds that house swept and garnished, it brings seven other spirits more powerful than itself. Now, when I was a young Christian, that always kind of confused me because if you think that house is swept and garnished at face value, that sounds like a positive thing almost. That sounds like a good thing. We swept the house. We cleaned that house. We swept it and garnished it. But according to Scripture, that's not a good thing. Now, now guys, that don't mean that you shouldn't help your wife sweep in the house. I'm not talking about natural things now. <laughs> I'm talking about spiritual things. What does that mean? Well, swept would mean empty. Garnished, what is garnish? I mean, I, I'm kind of redneck here, so it ain't going to get too deep with me, but garnish is that little green crap that they put on your plate when you buy a steak that nobody ever eats. It's just window dressing. Many people, God have mercy on our religious souls, man. Many people come to Jesus or claim to come to Jesus. They sweep it out. They get everything looking good. They garnish it up with window dressing, but inside they're empty. The Bible clearly says here that when that unclean spirit comes back in, if you haven't replaced that unclean spirit, if there's nothing there and it's just swept and garnished with window dressing, it may look good on the outside. It may look good on Sunday morning for you. You may know all the right catch words. How you doing? I'm blessed and highly favored. You know, we know what to say, how to say it, how to look, when to show up, man. But cutting through the chase, if you're empty inside, you're empty inside. And then the word of God says that he goes and takes seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And the to dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. I got to be honest with you, when, when, when I was a young Christian and, and, and young in ministry and new in ministry, man, it, it's a powerful thing to exercise the name of Jesus. And there were a number of times when something would happen, uh, somebody would come our way and won't help or this, that, and the other, man, we just throw them down, cast the devil at them. That's fun, and it's usually relatively easy to do. And they'd be free for a minute, but then they wouldn't follow up, allowing themselves to be discipled. And we were too ignorant to know that they needed to become a disciple, a follower, a follower wholeheartedly of Jesus. And then you'd see someone that maybe had had addiction or maybe had had uh, alcohol or maybe had mental illness, or, uh, different, different things like that. And they'd be okay for a little bit, but then six months later, they'd be seven times worse. And you're going, what happened? Well, they swept it and they put winter dressing up, but they didn't have a deep enough relationship. They weren't. They didn't refill themselves with anything. And when the enemy found them empty, they had no defense. I hope that makes sense, man. And so that's one reason a number of years ago, and then if you want to, you can look on our YouTube channel or our Facebook and go back from about two or three years. And, and through the years, the past 35 years, through trial and error, taking people through deliverance and, and helping folk, or at least attempting to help folk with demonic stuff, I, written, I wrote a manual. I've written a manual called The Prescription for Deliverance. And when I was young, we'd just throw you down, cast the devil out of you, man. But I found out that more often than not, it has a negative effect later on because, man, if you get some freedom, I, I know of I know of more than one person. I'll give you an, an instance here, and I'm just I'm just making observations and laying some stuff out. I, I can tell you of a time when a person wanted to be set free from the addiction of tobacco. They wanted to be set free from cigarettes and and, and okay, whatever, if you're ready, then we, we'll do that. So I'll never will forget it. It was right behind our church. There was a person that, that man, I, I want to be set free from, from cigarettes. And and uh, our brother Josh happened to be there. I believe it was Josh that night. And, and this person, we I don't remember how it happened, but we wound up out in the alley beside him behind the church there. And we prayed for this individual. And that power of God was just 
incredible. It was like a pow moment, you know? And so this person gets set free. It was awesome. And this was a lifelong chain smoker, essentially, and gets set free from it. It was so cool. It was like, Yay! You know, that's cool. More power to you. Wonderful. But didn't replace it where there was a void, didn't cultivate that freedom at all. And it wasn't long. I don't remember how long it was, but it wasn't very long that next thing you know, they're back smoking and smoking more than they did before. And then the funny thing about it is, is and I'm not, that person didn't, but I've seen other people do it. They, they, they want to blame God for the fact that they didn't stay free. And it's like, no, he gave you every tool that you needed, man. But, but you chose not to walk that out. Now that's, that's a almost trivial thing. I'm not saying it's trivial because that stuff can kill you, but, but it's almost a trivial thing like that. But it's a, still a principle, man that says, when that unclean spirit leaves, now it, it's going to come back knocking. I don't say that to to, boo, to try to scare you. I'm just saying, it's going to come back knocking. But man, if you'll arm yourself with the power of the name of Jesus, arm yourself with the blood of Christ, arm yourself through consistent prayer, hmm, consistent and constant prayer, Man, then you'll be ready when, when that kind of stuff comes. And after a while, it won't even be a, a big thing to you. Just boom, you rebuke it in the name of Jesus. Amen. But but so I, I've seen people that did that. So I, I essentially the way we do it now, we pretty much quit doing it that way. Somebody tells me now that they need help. And if you need some help from the demonic or if you need some help from uh, addiction or habits or stuff like that, come and talk to me, man. Message me. Let me know. We can help provide some help for you, but we do it a little differently now. I wrote that man. It took me about 20 something years to do it, but I, I wrote that thing. And now we take that as a manual to take people through deliverance and all the, the specific and different kind of things. And now the most important part of your deliverance. And let me just say, if you've been delivered from something in your life, if you're a follower of Jesus and you've been delivered from an addiction or any of these things we always talk about, then man, this will help you, and I call it deliverance maintenance. If you're not doing maintenance on your deliverance, man, you're losing ground. Maintenance, number one, prayer. Prayer is one is the biggest weapon in your deliverance maintenance that there ever can be. Prayer and then the Word of God, they go right hand in hand. If you're not praying and if you're not a student of the Word, if you're not into the Word of God, then how are you going to know how to apply it? So I want to encourage you, man. Pray. Jesus Jesus did that prayer, man, 40 days, 40 nights. Dealt with Satan himself. Came out, but when he came out, what does it say? He came out and he returned in the power of the Spirit. And so the power of the Spirit in that realm, tonight we're talking about dealing with that unseen realm. Dealing with that supernatural realm dealing with that realm of darkness. And man, you don't have to be seven times worse. I know somebody listening, probably a bunch of you listening can go, man, I've walked that out. I, I, I walked for a little while and then I got way worse. And, and, and it, it was it was horrible, man. Uh, and, and I want to read one more verse. I don't know how long I've been going. I've probably been going too long. In Luke chapter eight, it says in verse 40, and it came to pass that when Jesus was returned, the people gladly received him, for they were all waiting on him. And when he when he came out of that, then the, it showed. It was powerful. You'll find there uh, in Luke 11. Did I not read that? Yes, I did. Luke. <clears throat> You'll find there in, in one spot where Jesus... You remember the story when he went to the region of the Gadarenes and he came into that city. Now, I want you to hear with your spiritual ears, guys. He entered into a city, possibly and apparently a place he had never been before in the natural. When he got to that city, he did not go meet with the mayor. He did not go meet with the city council. He didn't even meet with the religious leaders, and there wasn't a bunch of hoopla. The first thing that happens there is you'll find that the demoniac came 
the demoniac that lived in the cemetery. I preach about this all the time, but think about it one more time. This demon-possessed man lived in the cemetery. They couldn't keep clothes on him. He was demon-possessed and crazy. Can you imagine when you went out to visit Aunt Gertrude's grave or Grandma's grave or whoever's grave to put flowers on it? You couldn't even do it because in that cemetery, there was a man that lived there that was crazy and naked and out of his mind demon-possessed, yeah? And they would try to arrest him. They would try to uh, tackle him, and they would put chains on him, and he'd break them free to the point that they gave up. Think about that. And this is the one that runs to Jesus, bowing down and worshiping him, the Bible says. It says, don't, don't deal with us before it's time. They were afraid of it. They recognized, think about this, the demons in that man recognized the authority that Jesus operated in recognized the power that he had, recognized him as the creator. Oh, they knew him. And then Jesus asked them, said, what is your name? Let me look this up. Let me just look this up. This is in Luke chapter 8, I believe. I don't want to tell you wrong. In Luke chapter 8, it says in verse 27 or verse 26, it says, They arrived at the country of the Gadarenes, which is over against Galilee. And when he went forth to land, there met him out of the city a certain man, which had devils a long time, and could wear no clothes, neither lived in any house but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him, and with a loud voice said, what have I to do with you, Jesus, you son of the most high? See, here's, here's I, I beg of you, do not torment me. And this devil knew, or these devils rather, knew exactly who Jesus was. It says, for he commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For oftentimes it had caught him, and he was kept bound with chains and in fetters, and he broke the bands and was driven of the devil into the wilderness. Hmm. Seems like the devil likes to dwell in wilderness. The demons, it seems, like to dwell in wilderness. Interesting. And Jesus asked him, saying, what is your name? And he said, Legion, because many devils were entered into him. And they besought him that he would not command them to go out into the deep. And there was there a herd of many swine feeding on the mountain. And they besought him that he would suffer them to enter into the swine. And he did. Then went the devils out of the man and entered into the swine and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the lake and were choked. I'm sorry, I got to do a stupid thing here. I got to do a little stupid joke. Pork bellies really took a dive. I'm, I shouldn't have done it. I couldn't resist. It's not that funny. But he cast those devils into the, into the, into the pigs and they ran violently down a steep place into the lake. And then when they that fed them saw what was done, they fled and went and told it in the city and in the country. Think about it, man. These pig farmers, minding their own business, working their pigs. One gospel said there was 2,000 of them. Yeah. And Jesus encounters this demon-possessed man. The demons beg Jesus, send us into the pigs. Now, here's my question. <laughs> swine was considered unclean pork was considered unclean to the jews under the law they were not allowed to eat it they were not allowed to have it and yet we got these jewish pig farmers ah huh, go figure i don't know and so then jesus put those, cast those devils out sent them into those pigs and they ran violently over a cliff and all died can you imagine the pig farmer that day, man, minding his own business? There were multiple pig farmers. There were a handful of them, I guess, minding their own business. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, they're dealing with demon-possessed pigs. Now, I've been around a lot of pigs in my life, and I've never met one yet that wasn't demon-possessed. But that's just my opinion. 
But anyway, there's these demon-possessed pigs all of a sudden, and they go crazy. And it says that the, those pig farmers fled. It's a nice way of saying they boogied, buddy. When that started happening, they got out of there, and they went and told everybody what had just happened. Now, back to the supernatural realm. Back to the fact that our battle is not against flesh and blood. Let me read this one, one more verse here in 2 Corinthians for chapter 10, verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Okay? It goes, it goes right along with Ephesians 6, 12, where it says, We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. 2 Corinthians says, even, when we're, even though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh, <clears throat> for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Did you know that prayer can also be a weapon against darkness? Prayer should also be a weapon against darkness. Prayer is a weapon against darkness. Think about it. Even though we're in the flesh, we don't war after the flesh. You're not going to you're not going to beat the devil by your intellect. You're not going to beat the devil by hard work. You're not going to beat the devil by anything you can do in the flesh. The only way you're going to you're going to win that war, man, is in the spirit. But mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting, well how do you pull down strongholds? Here you go. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. <clears throat> we talk about casting out devils and doing all this, and we kind of kid about the pigs and the swine and the cliff and the pig farmers and all that, and, and even the, the, the demoniac and the tombs there. Yeah, all that's powerful, all that's something. But then here in 2 Corinthians, the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul gives us more than a clue. It says, it doesn't say you're not in a war. It just says the war is not against flesh and blood. We don't war after the flesh because the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. This has got to happen in prayer. Christians, Christ followers, you keep losing the same old battles. You keep hitting the same old wall, like I said earlier. Man, make it a matter of consistent and regular and Holy Spirit-led prayer. And every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself. Huh, it's interesting that he'd go, the weapons of our warfa warfare are, are not carnal, but mighty through God. And then it says, casting down what? So the first thing he addresses here, imaginations. It's what's in your mind. It's not just what you think, it's how you think. What's your mind? What do you think about all the time? That's your God. What's on your mind most of the time? Is that an idol in your life or is it the Holy Spirit? Casting down imaginations, man. Those that big, you know, we talk about Jesus as ruler of the nations, and he's going to rule all nations. He's going to bring into uh, captivity and exercise authority over all the nations of the earth. Dare I say, may I say, that the biggest nation that needs to come down and be controlled is your imagination. My imagination. Okay? And the first thing it says, casting down imaginations. So when those thoughts come in your head, listen, I'm talking about prayer. I, we're using the prayer life of Jesus as a pattern. He came out on the other side of that, man. He had prayed. And when he did, his fame went out. When he did, he began to deal with things on a different level. He began to deal with things on an unseen level, man. So by the power of the name of Jesus, the blood of Christ, and being led by the Holy Spirit, Apostle Paul said they're casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. All those things that says, oh, that won't work. All those things that goes, that's not God. Or all those things that say, oh, this is just a bunch of hooey. 
you know, it's up to you, ladies and gentlemen, to take authority over your own thought life. It's up to you to give the reins to Jesus, to give control to the Lord. I didn't say it's the easiest thing you'll ever do. I just said it's up to you. Casting down every imagination, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against what? Against the knowledge of God. The enemy does not want you to be free. Darkness does not want you to be free. Sin does not want you to be free. And here God has given you all the tools that you need to exercise authority over the things that are destroying you, that are destroying your family, that are destroying your communities, man. And it's up to the body of Christ. Listen, we don't do nothing. We don't do anything. Nothing will be done. Hmm. He's given us every tool in our tool belt that we need. And that tool to start with is prayer. And he says there, weapons of our warfare, not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Is there a stronghold in your life? See, it's real easy for us to go, oh, no, no, no. But be honest with yourself. Is there a stronghold in your life that controls a certain area of your life? And you just keep thinking it's going to go away. You keep thinking, well, I'm saved, so God understands. Maybe you are saved, but and yes, he absolutely understands, but not in the way you think. He understands that you've not given lordship over to that area of your life. Yikes, boy, did the preacher just say that? I guess he did. So casting down imaginations in every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. So, man, when those things come in, take authority over them immediately in the name of Jesus. It's not a sin to be tempted. It's not a sin to have a, a lustful thought or, a, or a, a temptation thought come through your head. The sin is when you dwell on it and when you let that seed begin to take root. Where does it first take root? In between your ears, in your mind. That's why it says casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Man, especially when you're a new Christian, you're going to have your thought life at times may seem like complete chaos because you want to follow Jesus and then all of a sudden your thoughts will wander, your thought life temptation will come. Well, what about this? What about that? Well, I want to go do this. I want to go do that. I want to go see him or I want to go see her. I want to do what I've always, you know, I want to alleviate the pressure the way I have always before in my life through whatever means it was. And see, then those thoughts come in. The power there is when those temptations come in, when those thoughts come in, to bring them in captivity. In other words, no, no, devil. I'm not going to let you rule me through my thought life anymore. Come on, y'all. Hang with me a few more minutes. I'm not going to let you rule me through my thought life anymore. And I'm going to bring those thoughts into captivity. In my mind, when I was a young Christian, I began to first read this. I'm like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to chain those thoughts up, chain them up, put them in shackles. And bring them to the feet of Jesus. Bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So therefore, when that temptation comes in, rebuke it in the name of Jesus. I stand against it in the name of Jesus. Now, I bring it to, <coughs> I bring it into captivity. And if I bring it into captivity, then it's bringing that thought into the obedience obedience of Christ, then as I'm doing that, hang with me, come on, don't give up on me. What happens is when you begin to do that in the power of the Holy Spirit, and you make up your mind to do that and you start exercising your authority to do that, what's happening at that point, you are retraining your brain to not be carried away by every lust that comes, by not be carried, not to be carried away by every temptation that comes, and not to give yourself over to every temptation. Before I was a, a Christ follower, man, before I came to know him, if it was uh, a drug, I wanted to do it. If it was wrong, I wanted to do it. If it was sin, I wanted to do it. And that had been my lifestyle. That had been my thought process. 
that was not just what I thought, but that was how I thought. If we begin to implement this, therefore, you begin to change your thought patterns. You begin to bring your thought life into the obedience of Christ. And then when those temptations come, you go, no, 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 no. I'm not going to be tempted to go do that. In fact, I'm going to chain that sucker up and put it in shackles and lay it at the feet of Jesus because I have been powerless over it in my past. However, now greater is he, that being Jesus, greater is he that is within you than he that is in this world. Yeah. So, man, bring, the, bring your thought life into the obedience of Christ. It's not exactly all that easy, especially at first, because you're not just, ch we see, see the world and even some religious leaders will try to change what you think all the time. Well, yeah, that, that, but you can't change what you think until you change how you think. And the only way, to, only way to change how you think is by bringing those thoughts into the obedience of Christ, by bringing them into captivity and laying them at his feet, as it were, in the spirit, realizing that your power, you have been in the past powerless over them, but no longer are you powerless over them when you become a Christ follower and he begins to dwell inside of you. Remember, Jesus said, I am with you, but I'm going to be in you. Me and my father are going to come in and make our abode in you. So it's powerful that he makes his abode in you. He, he, he rules from here. He lives here here inside of you all right then you bring those thoughts into captivity when they come and by default the process begins to change and you're not just trying to change what you're thinking about or what you think you're changing how you think and in time as you implement that you'll grow stronger and stronger and stronger i'm not saying you'll never be tempted again i'm not saying those thoughts won't won't try to come in, but rather than uh, before when those thoughts would come in and it just bounces around everywhere and it just seems like chaos in between your ears and it's crazy and you finally just throw your hands up and give up. Yeah, no, 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 no. Now, when you bring those thoughts captive and bring them into obedience to Christ, you're re literally, you're retraining your brain. You're being as it were, brainwashed. I need my brainwashed. I'm telling you, especially when I first came to Jesus, I needed a good washing in my brain. Not brainwashed like the world thinks, but cleansed by the power of his word. And as you do that, it changes how you think. Therefore, you're not so apt to give over to darkness. Ladies and gentlemen, the weapon of your warfare is not carnal but mighty through God to the pulling down of these strongholds. You're not wrestling against flesh and blood. Quit, quit trying to beat the enemy. Quit trying to beat sin through your own actions, through your own tenacity. No, 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 no. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, and against spiritual wickedness and high places. Where does all that start? And it starts right in between my ears. It starts right in between our ears. So allow Jesus, I, I want to encourage you this week to allow Jesus to come in and not just change what you think, but allow him to begin to change how you think. Realize your battle is against an unseen realm and unseen forces in that realm. And without Christ, yeah, you're pretty much powerless against it. But with Christ, Greater is he that's in you than he that is in this world. So Jesus gives us this pattern of praying, gives us this pattern of being in the wilderness, but gives us this pattern of also coming out on the other side of that man and returning in the power of the Spirit. And when he returned in the power of the Spirit, and as you begin to do this, there will be a dynamic in your life that wasn't there before. There will be a dynamic in your life and a dynamic change in your life that wasn't there before, and it happens through prayer. So be a person of prayer, and like I've been saying each week, not just prayer, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, but also now we can learn that we can pray and influence 
the realm of darkness, in, influence principalities, influence spiritual wickedness in high places through prayer, and allow God to change us and recreate us and transform us through consistent and a conscious effort of the Lord. Yes, change what I think, but I can't really change what I think until I allow how I think to be changed. And ladies and gentlemen, that takes a little time. It takes practice. It takes discipline. That's why we're called his disciples. We're a Christ follower. We're a disciple. man. And if we're disciples and followers of his, then we're allowing him to discipline us. But we're allowing our minds, first and foremost, to be disciplined by the word of God, by the presence of God, and by the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. God bless you. You may go, well, where do I start? What do I do? Here's the best way to start. And I'm going to pray for you. Not going to get you to repeat a prayer with me, but but if nothing else, while you're watching this tonight, man, just come into agreement. Lord, I don't know where to start, but I agree with Pastor Killen. And I want to pray with you that God's going to begin a brand new journey in your life that's going to transform you and deliver you from the powers of darkness that seem to always be tripping you up. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we want to walk in the power of your spirit. Father, we understand that we don't war against the flesh. The weapons of our war, warfare are mighty. We understand, Lord, that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness in this world, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. Father God, without you, we're powerless against those things. So, Father, I pray right now in the name of Jesus that you begin to re reveal yourself in a fresh way, in a new way, in a powerful way to each one. And I pray specifically to those, Lord, that seem to always hit the same wall, those that, that, that want to love you, don't know how to change, Lord, how we think. When temptation comes, Lord, let us recognize that and run to you, not to our own devices, not to what we think we can do or to anyone else, but let us run to you. And Father God, deliver us from spiritual wickedness. Deliver us, Lord, from any stronghold. Deliver us from the imaginations or any high thing that tries to exalt itself up against the knowledge of you. Lord, teach us and allow us to bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And I thank you for that, Father, in Jesus' name. Listen, God bless you. Uh, if you live in the Brownwood area and you don't have a place to, to call home for church, you don't have a church home, we do meet in the building 1030 on Sunday mornings, 1001 Bell Plain Street, on the corner of Cordell and Bell Plain in Brownwood, Texas. And you guys, we love to worship with you. Y'all come on. We're going to have a great time Sunday morning. Y'all come and fellowship with us. And as always, you can always watch us online. We're going to always be here. And I do appreciate those of you that watch. And God bless you. And we will see you next time. Bye now.